Andre Broz, Tito's youngest grandson by the first of three wives, was seven when his grandfather died and 18 when the wars of the early 1990s broke out. This must be about two years later. Yes. He's stretching out his hand towards you. He's obviously a very proud grandfather. Yes, he is. My parents, since I, I remember it only by some short stories or pictures I had with him. I remember I my one, father telling me when the, when the war started, we were talking about what could have been done or what, what were the ideas earlier. And he, he was talking at what point and said that, uh, that he believed that having the center of Yugoslavia in Serbia was a great mistake. I myself am an economist. And what I did was I studied in, in Russia, economy, and first thesis that I had to write was about the war in Yugoslavia, but from economic perspective. I took statistical yearbooks from Yugoslavia at that time, and I was looking at the economic development of the, of the countries. And you had Slovenia and Croatia at that point making about 70% of economics, and most of that was going into the central uh, Serbian part. You also had Bosnia, which had great capital in, in mines and, and in ores there, which has also been sold, and the capital went back to Serbia. Of course, in every conflict, you have to have a couple of things. One of them is economics. People are starting to ask questions, okay, so why do we have to give you the money so you can spend it on something else? Why cannot we build a rose? Why cannot we build things like that? So really, the, the, I believe that the combination of nationalism, one nation, whatever nationality, trying that to be, to be the bigger one, the better one, the higher one, and you have the economics on the other side, you will definitely have some kind of uh, conflict. It is a conflict that Raif Dizdarovic thinks may have been avoided if his party had responded faster to the growing civil unrest. Our steps to favorize the future of Yugoslavia, they were too slow for democratization of Yugoslavia. We thought we made so much in the past. We were too slow. To, 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 to make up our mind if we don't do the change that we are going uh, entering the deeper and deeper crisis and our steps towards democratizations they were just uh, m uh, smaller than it was a need. Dostarovic was one of the leading politicians in Tito's time and in the ten years after his death. He was one of the presidents of the rotating presidency. In 1989, it was due to be handed over to Stepan Mesic, another veteran, who until February this year was president of Croatia. The Serbs intervened and blocked the handover, leading to the breakup of the Communist Party and of Yugoslavia itself. During Tito's time, Mesic played a leading part in the Croatian Spring of 1967. The Croats were pushing for more rights for themselves and for economic and democratic reforms across the whole country. He later became Secretary General of the Non-Aligned Movement that Tito helped establish. If Mr. Message had been the last of the rotating presidents, if he had not been blocked, does he think that the war could have been prevented, the wars? The war could have been prevented with only one scenario, and that scenario is, uh, was where if uh, Milosevic would accept a new political agreement, because the federation that was created by Tito has... So to, so to say, uh, it became tired, and uh, none of the citizens were happy with that model anymore. Yes, My suggestion was a confederate model, and Serbia never accepted it. And now we're outside the White House in snowbound Belgrade, a magnificent uh, estate of fir trees and grand buildings. It was completed two years after the assassination of the present Crown Prince's grandfather. It was the home over the years, of course, for Tito and Milosevic. And now it's under royal occupation again since the return of Crown Prince Alexander in 2000. Let's go meet the Prince. How are you? Very honored to meet you, sir. I've never thought I'd have the pleasure to meet you in your palace. <laughs> yes, it's brilliant. amazing. Brilliant. So good to see you. No, thank you. I well, I was born in London. Um, in 1945, and I was born in Claridge's, and it was turned into Yugoslav territory by uh, the then Prime Minister. And uh, my father was hoping to come back. Uh, what killed him in the end was the homesickness, and he was never allowed back. I became an enemy of the state in 1947. I was two years old and very dangerous. The Crown Prince, Alexander Karadjordjevic, returned from exile in October 2000 
after what he calls Serbia's Velvet Revolution. He now resides in the palace, the family home which had not changed much since his grandfather's time, except for the odd red star etched into a wall and a bullet hole in the chapel. It was a, a big moment for my life. I never thought I'd come back. I'm curious, and this palace was built for your family? Yes, this one was built for my grandfather, and it was finished in 1929. So did you regard Tito and then Milosevic as kind of usurpers? Well, they were very imperial, uh, weren't they? We had, of course, Second World War, Civil War, and then my father never came back, and we had a dictatorship which lasted many years. There was no democracy. The whole place was kept together by brutal strength. If Tito had governed differently, could those wars have been avoided? Oh, yes. I think that uh, if one had been smart and allowed democracy to prevail, things would have been very different. <laughs> but it didn't ever happen. I mean, are you giving him credit for anything at all? Well, for dressing rather well. I would say, and for having a, a wardrobe of many shoes and extraordinary colored uniforms, I think he did rather well there. I would question, who was he? Who was Tito? There are many perceptions of who he really was. But for Andre Broz, he was neither a monarch nor a partisan hero, just a young boy's grandfather. This is still a problem talking with people here in the region because they saw him on television or read about him, learned in the school about him. But I really met him only as a grandfather. But it was obvious that this whole system is going somewhere very wrong. People change, states change, and you cannot enforce anything on them. If you try to, to keep something bottled up, it's like trying to cook something and keeping the lid on it will be explosion. And this really what happened here is we didn't see it as an end of something, but as a change of something that is needed to be changed. The Croats' earlier successes had been at the smaller bases. Today was time to lay siege to a large one, a major artillery and transport headquarters with as many as 600 federal troops inside. The Croats were close, not more than 100 yards away, and urging the soldiers to come out. Then a Croatian officer tried to communicate. Gentlemen soldiers, he said, do surrender or we will destroy your barracks and raise it to the ground by tonight. Then the air raid warning sounded. It was a reminder that the greater firepower lies with the defending side. But the siege continues. It is psychological warfare under the gun. Slovenia and Croatia declared their independence on the same day in June 1991. The war in Croatia began almost immediately between its Croat majority and Serb minority. And when Croatia's independence was recognized by the European Union in January 1992, that made war in Bosnia all but inevitable. A war between its three constituent peoples that cost 97,000 lives. And so, nationalism dug Yugoslavia's grave its songs and flags banned under Tito, came out of hiding and fanned the flames of war. Some of the fiercest battles in Croatia were fought on the highway of brotherhood and unity. Tito's dream died almost overnight, along with the statues and streets that bore his name. Join me next week as I travel to Bosnia to explore the legacy of Tito's Yugoslavia there, in a country whose problems have not been resolved but merely parked a country that's still not really at peace and which some are calling the Black Hole of the Balkans. The Rise and Fall of Yugoslavia, The Story of Tito, was presented by Martin Bell and produced by Gemma Newby. It was an all-out production for BBC Radio 4.